There is a lot of official Pokemon games in a vast amount of ROM hacks which alter their original counterparts, but I truly believe that the Driano ROM hack Pokemon Renegade Platinum is not only the best ROM hack I've ever played, but also without a doubt, the best Pokemon game I've ever played so far. Outright putting the mainline Pokemon games to shame, with its absolutely incredible redesigns, ingenious gameplay revamps. It's crazy how this one ROM hacker is better designing Pokemon gameplay than the whole of Game Freak, which is always pandered to casuals and children. And I'm not only talking about Gen 6 and onwards, most of the older generations also were incredibly dumbed down, such as the original Gold and Silver, where an actual monkey could steamroll the game without breaking a sweat. But I'm gonna go one step further and claim that Renegade Platinum, because of the gameplay system overhaul, is not just the best Pokemon game, but also one of the most engaging, gameplay focused RPGs in general. Cause let's be honest, Pokemon is a gameplay focused RPG, not story driven in the least. Well Game Freak did try to write actual plots but failed pretty much every time with the exception of maybe Gen 5. In this video I want to argue my point as to why Renegade Platinum is such an amazing experience unlike any other game. I was absolutely blown away in my first playthrough of this game. I'll be explaining what this game does differently than the baseline Platinum and how these changes blow out of the water completely. And I'll also be comparing the RPG mechanics to other games such as Dark Souls and Elder Scrolls in terms of how the difficulty is handled. I'll be getting pretty in depth about the nature of difficulty in RPGs and what constitutes good difficulty and bad difficulty in games, so let's get into what exactly Renegade Platinum is and what it changes from the original. Now many of you will already know some of the changes this game has made over the original, but the most important change is absolutely the difficulty, combined with all the quality of life features, there's so many of them. Levels in general are higher, the AI is massively improved from the garbage AI that the first three generations had. The AI now will almost always attack with the most optimal moves. Boss battles are the most important changes of the game, almost all of them having a full team of 6 Pokemon, with items and natures and competitive move pools. Later game they will also be EV trained. For example your rival Barry can pack a Focus Sash Breloom with Spore and Technician, and a Curse Rest Snorlax with leftovers, there are no pushovers and you have to be careful of them. Gym leaders are also wild in this game. No longer are the teams absolutely idiotic, like in Gen 2 and 3, where the teams were just pitiful. A level 7 Pidgey? What the hell is this? It doesn't even have a flying move, is this real life? But here, the gym leaders are genuine threats, all with 6 varied Pokemon, designed to counter their weaknesses. No longer can you just sweep the first gym leader because you brought a water type. Well, it is possible to do that, but it does require a very specific strategy unless you're really over leveled. Some of this Pokemon are actually quite fast and have powerful Thunder Punch users along with Thunder Wave to beat their counters. And oh god, the Elite Four and Champion in this game are just insane. Not only are their teams really threatening, but here the Elite Four and Champion all have 4 separate teams that get chosen at random when you battle them, making the battles different each time you fight them. This was such an amazing idea as it gives so much replay value for these boss battles. Bertha uses a sand team which is crazy, and in one battle she had an offensive swamper which I beat with Tangrove, but in the post game rematch she used a tanky variant with the grass resist berry and a bear coat which was able to completely counter and destroy my Tangrove by surprise. This was a massive brain play from the AI and I was genuinely impressed with the strategies that they used. Such as the use of weather teams and really unexpected coverage options, really big brained. There are a few other battles, such as the one against Dawn where she in fact changes her lead Pokemon to specifically counter your own, which is a feature that I wanted to see more from in this game as it was so engaging. No longer can you just play an autopilot cause you already know what's coming up in the game, which can ruin the surprise in the run. Now you really have to think about the placement of your Pokemon. The Elite 4 can lead off with 2-4 to four different Pokemon and you don't know which one it will be, 
For example, Aaron could lead off with a Masquerine, a Yanmega, a Cypher, or a Venomoth. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Venomoth and Masquerine suck. Well, they sure don't in this game. Another amazing overhaul is that here, virtually every Pokemon is competitively viable to an extent. Yes. It's really cheap in games such as Fire Red Omega, which is another Giano ROM hack that I really love, but isn't as amazing as Renegade Platinum. In Fire Red Omega in particular, if you were nuzlocke the game, you had to accept the fact that the game was not fully balanced, and that many Pokemon were simply not viable, and would only be a liability to train up and use in battle. For example, Ferret and Radicate were incredibly weak. Pokemon like Beedrill and Arbok were rendered completely useless by the complete lack of any good moves to learn in the game, while many Pokemon such as Rapidash and Seeking were simply power crept by more viable alternatives. This was frustrating as it meant that in Nuzlocke, you could be screwed over by simply getting bad Pokemon which wasn't very fair. In Renegade Platinum, every single conventionally bad Pokemon has been buffed in some way to be at least somewhat usable. Many types and abilities have been altered, along with how every Pokemon now has access to good moves now, through level ups, infinite early TMs, free move tutors and move relearners. Thank god for this change, this is so good. No longer do you have to worry about using your one and only TM Earthquake that you can only use once. Well, some Pokemon such as Kingler for example, could have gotten buffed, and some of the buffs were a little bit minor, these new changes make it so no Pokemon is absolutely useless. Look at the barrel. Damn, now this is more useful. Seeking? Nice, that's some serious power. And Flygon? Jesus Christ, is a special attacking bug pseudo legendary. Nice. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that in this game, every single Pokemon is catchable, without stupid trading or game exclusive shenanigans. Imagine having to buy DLC to use your favourite Pokemon. Even the early game Pokemon that you get are no longer trash. Combine these newfound buffs with the fact that the game gives you a huge amount of gift Pokemon is what makes Nuzlocking so incredibly fun. You get given every single starter Pokemon outside of encounters, which all have been altered in at least some way, along with every fossil Pokemon, a few eggs, Eevee and more. I usually do allow these gift Pokemon in Nuzlocke because of the very high difficulty and the fact that many boss battles use these same Pokemon. This combined with a high amount of separate areas in the game made Nuzlocke in this game downright addictive. Now here's a question for you the viewer. Think about the most addictive game that you've played, such as Skyrim, Dark Souls, Fallout or Deus Ex Human Revolution. What made the gameplay so engrossing? You know the feeling. You're having so much fun with the game that you just can't put it down. When you're not playing it, you're thinking about what happened in the last session. And when the game's finally over, you already want to start another playthrough. I'd argue that it's the sheer variety, customization, and near infinite combinations of gameplay elements that makes games like Deus Ex so fun. The fact that each playthrough has almost unlimited combinations of options and gameplay choices, combined with meaningful choice and consequences, is so good. Renegade Platinum gives you so many Pokemon, even in a Nuzlocke, that you can use in battle. Each Pokemon is viable and has a massive move pool to choose from. They can be used in several different ways individually, and you've got to assemble a team of 6 Pokemon to create your very own unique team. There's so much customization, so many options. How could I forget the EV training form? What a godsend. Did I mention that you can easily EV train any Pokemon however you see fit? Like you're on Pokemon Showdown, giving you even more control over how to customize each and every Pokemon. The fact that there's infinite TMs in move relearners also means that unlike the earlier generations, you're not punished for making decisions or experimenting which honestly was a stupid idea. Like, if you had several Pokemon which needed to learn Earthquake, then tough shit, you can only use it once. Or if you decide to relearn a move, you have to really go out of your way to do that. Well, not anymore. Here you're fully encouraged to experiment with new ideas, 
builds and tech choices, leading to a humongous amount of variables in team building, where you're not limited by garbage mechanics. I've played this game several times and I already want to jump back in again. The reason why the customization is so good is because of the very challenging and well designed boss battles. They use good strategies and require you to change your strategies to counter them effectively. But the game gives you full freedom of customization at any point. You know that Crasher Wake will have water types and that his gym has Perma Rain, which got added, which is tough as hell. You're aware of this and can use the vast pool of Pokemon that you should have caught to make a good team to counter him effectively. Well, unless you got really unlucky and you lost a lot of really good Pokemon in Nuzlocke to get to this point, but you know what I mean. Fighting Wake's souped up Permarine team looks very challenging, as he's got threats that can really abuse the rain. If you go in without preparation, you might get utterly destroyed. But because I took caution and prepared, I came up with some pragmatic solutions to easily counter his rain team. I saw that his lead Pokemon was Quagsire, so I used my bulky Pokemon to weaken it with a burn allowing my Venusaur to switch in and set up Sunny Day to nullify the rain advantage. Then I can easily use Substitute and Grove to set up, because I went out of my way to weaken its lead Pokemon. This allowed Venusaur to destroy Wake's biggest threats, while removing the terrain advantage. This is one of the countless strategies you can use to beat Wake. Each and every one of my viewers will find their own strategies to do this, depending on their own experience. But the people who are the most creative and logical, who plan effectively will do very well in this Nuzlocke, because I won't lie, completing an extreme Nuzlocke in this game is very, very hard, unless you really know what you're doing. This is a segue into my next point, all about Nuzlocking, and why I think that Nuzlocking is a definitive way to play Renegade Platinum, and why this actually enhances the gameplay experience tremendously. I love Nuzlocking. The reality is that playing the game normally has become boring to me, and it extends to other role playing games also. I've grown to adore doing Iron Man runs in Dark Souls and Elder Scrolls. When you play Pokemon normally, the game becomes kind of autopilot. There's no real meaningful choice, you just play it until you win, simply with little thought. But in a Nuzlocke, the dynamic of any Pokemon game is turned completely on its head. Like a good story or anime, Suddenly, there's stakes involved, real consequences for mistakes, and the difficulty of the game is far greater. Particularly in hard ROM hacks, this makes the game become very intimidating to play, and it's normal to feel nervous when going into a boss battle, just like in Dark Souls. But unlike in Dark Souls, you actually cannot respawn at a bonfire, it's harder. Well, some people do allow continued play as long as you discard the whole team, but that's beside the point. Not only is the gameplay far more tense and engaging, but also from a plot and role playing perspective, because after all, people forget that Pokemon is a role playing game. The Nuzlocke just grabs your attention and forces you to pay attention because every little thing now has meaning. It's really immersive. Here's a good example to illustrate how adding Nuzlocke restrictions actually enhances the role playing of the game. Dragon Ball Super was incredibly dumb because of the complete lack of stakes and consequences. Someone dies like Piccolo, oh just revive him with the Dragon Balls. A big tournament with Universe 6, well the Z fighters themselves even say that the results don't even matter, earth moving places won't really affect them. Or in the big epic supposed finale for the fate of the multiverse, not only was it really obvious, but you knew for a fact that Universe 7 would win and just undo everything bad that happened with the Super Dragon Balls. It was so stupid. No stakes, no real threats, no tension, no reason to care about the awful plot. Whereas Dragon Ball GT of all things was much better in this regard. Omega Shenron was a direct consequence of past RNG hacks abuse from the Dragon Gang. Like that specky bitch who always crits every single turn on Pokemon Showdown, you know who I'm talking about. Or that dipshit at Yu-Gi-Oh locals who opened triple Sky Striker and Gage every single game. All the well virtue signaling about how Sky Strikers were not the most unfair deck of all time, the bitch. Anyways, in GT, the Dragon Ball MacGuffins are gone. No more reviving characters. Piccolo is permanently dead for a meaningful sacrifice. Everyone on planet Earth is facing immediate perma death. Shit got real. And after the arc got resolved, Goku had to disappear from reality forever. Now, I know that comparing the scenario 
of an omnipotent dragon destroying the entire universe because a monkey boy was abusing dragon testicles, to a romp hack about pocket monsters is a bit weird. The analogy shows that meaningful consequences that require hard choices that can lead to meaningful consequences makes the game so much more interesting. You're on the edge of your seat, like against a tough Dark Souls boss. You feel anxious when preparing for a hard battle. One wrong move and you're permanently dead. This really allows you to roleplay the game and really immerse yourself into the game world, despite the plot being unchanged from the original Platinum. The original plot really wasn't that interesting. The new gameplay system is the plot now. Similar to how in Dark Souls, there is a very vague plot, but the real plot is a journey through this very difficult world. I guess the real story were the friends you made along the way. You're role-playing yourself, being in the main protagonist's shoes and asking yourself, what should I do in this situation? Which pulls you into the game better than any Pokemon plot has ever done. Because the stakes of losing the Nuzlocke are personal, you literally lose the entire game and have to reset hours of progress, you don't want that to happen, so you concentrate 100% of your brain on what's happening. And when things do well, when your strategies pay off and you're outsmarting the tough AI, it feels amazing. Like how I was able to beat both Cyrus boss battles back to back without any casualties despite having to fight two freaking overleveled legendaries and another boss fight right after that, despite being outmatched I won without any casualties by purely outsmarting the AI and bringing counters specifically for this boss battle which was so rewarding. You have to play smart to succeed in this game. To make the Nuzlocke even more challenging and immersive, I do add in more rules which I do recommend to you. No items can be used in battle like revives or X items as most people will agree that they are cheap. My main point is that set mode is the definitive way to Nuzlocke this game and anyone who disagrees with me is just flat out wrong. People complained that I was being too harsh in gatekeeping what counts as a legit Nuzlocke, but after further reflection I truly believe that shift mode is counterintuitive and just dumb. Not only does shift mode really hold your hand and makes the game way easier, but it fundamentally changes how the game is played, for the worst. The fact that you can essentially switch out at will is unfair and is basically you breaking the rules of the game. Nobody else in the game is allowed to do this, but you the player can for some reason. It's an unfair advantage. Imagine playing on Pokemon Showdown against another player online, and they can use shift mode but you couldn't. How unfair would that be? But the other main reason is that this really dumps down the battles of the Nuzlocke. See, when building a team to counter a boss fight like your rival Barry, who's got a physical attacking hyper offense team which is really threatening, you the player will be tested on your true skills as a Nuzlocker and a battler. You need to beat his threats while ensuring that you don't suffer losses yourself. You have to account for him bringing in strong attackers that can check your Pokemon and you will be forced to switch out or lose a Pokemon. Like if you've got no counters for a Spore Breloom, you'll be in a lot of trouble, which is why balanced team building is so important in an extreme Nuzlocke. You need a defensive core that can safely switch in and handle threats and counter them. Alkazam, Metagross, Garchomp, they will come up and you have to counter them or you will certainly lose at least one Pokemon in the process. This is what separates a good Nuzlocker from a great one. The great player will think competitively about making a balanced team that can synergize well with each other to handle any threat. Against Barry, I brought counters for each of his Pokemon. Max physical defense Tangrowth was made specifically to counter his Breloom in Azumarill, which is why I was able to destroy an otherwise extremely tough boss battle. It's so rewarding and fun. You will spend loads of time brainstorming and optimizing teams that can work well together. Now about why shift mode sucks, see if you're playing on shift mode then you don't need to build a balanced team at all. You don't need to have a big brain and you can get away with playing like a noob because the game will hold your hand and will always let you get the switch initiative. How convenient. You can literally have a team of 6 glass cannons and just win loads of battles in a nuzlocke without any casualties really easily as you can't get revenge killed which is a big factor in online battle. You always have the switch advantage which is completely backwards to how competitive battling should be. 
In an extreme Nuzlocke, each boss battle feels like you're actually playing against another person on Pokemon Showdown, which is what makes the battle so memorable. The final and most meaningful restriction I like to add in my Nuzlocke is the extreme rule set where you cannot overlevel the next gym leader in the game. You have to use a level cap, which increases the difficulty drastically and forces a lot of tactical play. You can't simply outgrind the opponents and you have to fight them on their level. This is what makes the boss battles so tense to fight against. So many times I see on Discord and Reddit, the experiences of other people who attempted to nuzzle this game and failed over and over again. But after seeing their teams and the decisions that they made, it's obvious to me that the game for the most part is not unfair at all. The only cheap thing is that sometimes critical hits in RNG can be frustrating, which is always a problem in Pokemon games, but the enemy trainers themselves aren't actually that insanely hard to handle, particularly the early game ones. If you're struggling to nuzlocke the game, unless you're completely blind, if you know what the opponents have roughly and you're still getting your ass handed to you, then it's probably your own fault for not being serious enough or half-assing your team building. People risk everything on a very specific setup strategy, but didn't stop to think that maybe it wouldn't work and that they would need a plan B just in case. A lot of people also stupidly lose their most important Pokemon in really dumb places which are completely avoidable, then proceed to complain about the game when in reality they were playing like dumbasses. If you're doing an inconsequential wild battle at the beginning of the game to grind some XP quickly, why the hell would you risk leaving in your Pokemon when it's in critical hit range? It takes like 5 seconds to switch out and prevent it, but no, people are just impatient. I mean, I have done that plenty of times in the past. It was still stupid. You have to take RNG into consideration and oftentimes just assume that luck will be against you because numerically it will at some point. Then I see people who struggle at points due to just bad team building. Like the first boss battle against Mars. She's not easy to beat as her ace probably got a big buff and is very early in the game but it's not that hard to counter if you're prepared. People get too cocky and rush in with 6 random Pokemon without any thought of how those Pokemon can actually work together to counter the Progly safely, they are basically going in without a plan. Whereas if they actually stopped and took the time to think, they'd realise that there are Pokemon that can counter Progly, or at least give you a big advantage in beating it, like Geodude, Onix and Rhyhorn to name a few. They can easily counter Progly. In this game, you can't just slap 6 random Pokemon on a team late game and expect it to do well without a plan. Like how, on one of my earlier playthroughs, I once made a team consisting of like Float Cell, Crobat, Camera Up, Sand Slash, Love Disk, and another Pokemon. These Pokemon, they can be pretty good in a vacuum, but they've got absolutely no synergy with each other. They can't switch into threats to cover each other's weaknesses. Well, on their own, they can hit hard, but as a team, it can't counter anything safely without sure casualties. And the hard hitters like Sand Slash and Camera Up are slow as hell so they can't switch in without getting blasted. You need a strong defensive core to hold your team together and ideally you need status and or recovery options. Like this team here, I've got two offensive sweepers, one of which is Focus Sash to ensure that I can switch in and take a hit safely. Then the rest is made up of bulky walls that can heal up, use status and counter most threats. It gives you a lot of safety. Now here's a way to determine if your late game team is good or not. Let's say your opponent leads off with an Alkazam. Can anything on your team switch in and handle it effectively? Remember that Alkazam in this game has really good coverage like Dazzling Gleam and Grass Knot. If your answer is no, then your team building might need some improvement. This is a common threat in the game and if your only plan is to not have a plan against Alkazam, then you're probably not playing as well as you could be. Unless you know for a fact that the upcoming battles will not have an Alkazam in that you won't actually need a counter for it. Now, I've gone on for quite a while about the nuances of Nuzlocking Renegade Platinum, but the main reason why playing the game this way is so amazing compared to not only every other Pokemon game, but also a lot of other role playing games in general, is because of one thing which Pokemon has never really done that well, and that is organic difficulty. There is organic and artificial difficulty. Artificial difficulty usually refers to making game harder by simply having enemies with a higher health bar, 
or by abusing cheap strategies or requiring the player to do massive amounts of grinding. Whereas organic difficulty is when the game becomes more difficult by testing the player's skill and requiring more thought and engagement. The right kind of difficulty. When you think about it, making a game harder in of itself does not make a game better. But when the difficulty increase is implemented in a way that's engaging, then it becomes very fun. Some examples of this difference would be comparing Elder Scrolls Morrowind to Skyrim. While both are pretty artificial in difficulty, Morrowind was a lot more artificial, as the combat system was almost completely dice roll in its fights, where the probability of you winning was almost completely dependent on your character's stats. Whereas in Skyrim, there's at least some player input that can impact your chances of winning. A more skilled player will have a better chance of winning, such as being able to time your blocks and bashes, using stealth, and managing your stamina effectively. Another really good example would be like the old school Final Fantasies, the Final Fantasy XV, which gives you full control of your character. A player can compensate for a lack of stats with their skill. Dark Souls 2 was arguably the most artificial of the Soulsborne series, with awkward controls, bad hitboxes, more bugs, and enemy design which got borderline unfair at times, and to rely on platforming with bad controls, making controlling your character clunky at times and resulting in random cheap deaths, whereas Dark Souls 3 did away with this, having a far more fast and fluid control scheme, making the game far more reliant on player skill in combat instead. Pokemon Gold and Silver, which so many people like to jerk off, were far more artificial than people will make you think. The AI is really bad at times, I'm talking light platinum levels of bad, almost laughable at points, such as Fury Cutter Crobat in the Elite Four. Hell, you can beat Trainer Red with level 50s without having to use any cheap strategies. The opponents in the game were pretty pathetic, a monkey could steamroll the game easily. But the only reason any casual gamer might struggle, particularly in the Nuzlocke, is solely because of the game has a total lack of XP. You have to grind because of this, which is so time consuming and is really obnoxious, completely disincentivizing the player from long grinding sessions as it gets too boring. Like, imagine having to grind your team to level 70 without speed up on level 30 world encounters. I won't do that shit. This artificial difficulty does in fact make the game harder, but for the wrong reasons. The AI is still bad, their teams still suck, but the only reason you might possibly struggle is because to even approach the opponent's level, you have to spend so much time grinding, which is not a fun mechanic. As soon as you do approach the level the game expects you to be at, then the challenge becomes completely laughable. This is not a good design. Artificially extending your playtime by mandating arbitrary grinding sessions. Renegade Platinum's difficulty is so much better it's crazy. It's almost completely organic. Well, as organic as a Pokemon game can be. Because pretty early on, you get access to the EV training form, allowing you to build a fully optimised competitive team effortlessly, like it's Pokemon Showdown. The game does not hold you back. You get access to all the moves, XP and EV farming you could possibly need, but so does the AI. The AI goes all out and is merciless on you, with big brain strategies and competitive teams. The fact that you can farm XP like nothing, combined with the level cap of the extreme Nuzlocke, makes the game completely fair and even more engaging, because you're fighting the boss battles with the exact same rule set as you. You both have 6 powerful optimised Pokemon on your team. Where the Nuzlocke is all about your skill as a player in team building and battling. I guess it's kind of like a role playing game that has like a level scaling mechanic, it makes the game more fair. And not about wasting hours of time grinding. The game sure is hard though despite that. But like Bloodborne for example is completely fair. Yes there is a learning curve in that game, but once you learn it, you can handle the game confidently. You earn your wins through skill. Playing the game this way is an unforgettable experience. Hell, even in Victory Road, where I was 7 levels above the normal trainers, I still had to be very careful and respect the AI because they can still do a lot of damage if you're not careful. This was made even more fun by the fact that I've never actually played the original Platinum. Imagine that, this was like a completely new experience for me. My last playthrough of this game, where I finally won, was truly special to me. 
Though the plot did suck a bit just like most other Pokemon games, my own journey through the Suno region was the real plot. The soundtracks were so immersive, they really pulled me in and were so relaxing to listen to. And finally, after many failures, once I finally beat the entire main game and the post game with the extreme Nuzlocke rules, man, I got the feels. Watching the credit roll with that soundtrack, I feel like I've been through so much, with over 30 of my favourite Pokemon dead throughout the Nuzlocke, and having almost lost a few times myself gotten really close, through it all, my strategies prevailed over the crazy final boss battle. This was a playthrough. The same feeling after completing Dark Souls for the first time, or a 100 hour playthrough of Fallout. You don't want the game to end, but when it does, you feel happy. Because after all, you already want to play the game again. A new playthrough, a whole new experience, with a completely different mentality, strategies to use and options to play with. We're only just getting started. Oh boy. That pretty much concludes the video. Overall, Rengate Platinum is just fantastic. And if you haven't played it then, what the hell are you waiting for? People never shut the fuck up about Sinnoh remakes, cause go get them views, right? But you know what, honestly, I don't think I even want a remake of Sinnoh. Not only are Driano's own remakes everything that I could ever want in a remake, undoubtedly better than anything Game Freak will ever make, honestly seeing as how Generation A has gone, I don't have faith in a remake. Imagine a game where you can actually catch them all without having some stupid version exclusives, gimmicks, or fucking paid DLC. This game is everything you need, and it goes right up there with some of my favourite games ever. I hope you enjoyed this video, this was crazy. Completely different experience from my usual challenge runs. I truly hope you enjoyed the video thesis, and if it does well, I would love to do more videos just like this. I feel like this is way more engaging than me just narrating over battles. But yeah, support the video if you want to see more and I hope you've learned something new. This is Ding Dong, signing out.